Uh, just a brief announcement about the grade book. So you can log on to Blackboard right now and see your weighted average in the course, but there hasn't been much submitted so far. You know, we've got that one quiz and your attendance grade, and so you're going to see quite a lot of variability in the early part of the semester until you have a few graded items. And so my point is, I don't think you should worry too much about what your grade says at this point because uh, it's not really representative of the bulk of the point categories that are described on the syllabus. Um, all right, so um, homework one is due on Friday, and you should submit that as a PDF file. And I think probably by now most people have had to do that in some class. You can use a flatbed scanner. You can take a picture of it with your phone, but don't upload a JPEG. That's just an ordinary image file. You should take a picture of it using some sort of a PDF creating app. So two of the apps that I think are good is Adobe Scan or Cam Scanner. Both of those produce good image quality. They kind of enhance the contrast. But you still need to pay attention to the lighting and shadows uh, because if what you submit isn't legible, then you won't be able to have your work scored. Uh, so I prefer black and white. That's something that you can get to down in the settings after you take a picture of it with your scanner. Uh, Grayscale is also okay, but the reason why I don't like to have color scans is it just um, it reduces the contrast if you're uploading the picture in color. So it's just better from the perspective of contrast and focus and readability if you do it in grayscale or black and white. All right, so those uh, problems that are due on Friday are just some practice problems. So you get some experience using the well equations, both steady state and unsteady state. So I think it should be pretty much just a takeoff from the examples that we worked in class on Friday. Now today we're going to move on to chapter five in the book, which is just some basic principles related to chemical handling and storage. Um, these are principles that you need to be aware of as a designer or maybe somebody who uh, would be refurbishing or redesigning or maybe upgrading a water or wastewater treatment facility. Um, there's more material in this chapter than we're going to be able to cover in a single 50-minute lecture. And that's kind of going to be pretty common through the semester that you know we're racing to get a wide breadth of exposure and then uh, sometimes I won't be able to tell you all of the useful and valuable information that you could get from the textbook so um, I do consider it as a reading assignment for you to go through chapter 5 and there can be things on quizzes and exams that are from the textbook that we maybe didn't necessarily cover in detail during the class um, so I think for you to really know this material to the extent that you need it to work professionally in water and wastewater treatment, you need to make reading the textbook a part of your study for this course. All right, so um, chapter five starts off by talking about the idea of redundancy. And we talked a bit about redundancy already this semester. And uh, the textbook differentiates between chemicals that can be considered as interruptible versus non-interruptible. And um, so chlorine gas, as an example, does anybody recall what chlorine is used for in water and wastewater treatment? Disinfection. Disinfection. And so consider the consequences if your supply of chlorine was interrupted. For a drinking water treatment plant, suddenly you're putting people at risk of uh, illness and infection. In the case of wastewater treatment, you are discharging um, pathogens into a receiving body which downstream may be a source for a community that's going to use it as their water supply. And so the consequences of running out of chlorine are pretty significant. And so chlorine would be a, considered an example of a non-interruptible chemical. 
whereas orthophosphate, and the picture here is taken from a well house that I have told you about before. It's where I did quite a lot of experiments when I was working on my PhD at Purdue that um, this particular groundwater source had quite a lot of calcium in it, and so they had to add orthophosphate to the water to prevent that calcium from depositing itself on the, um, on the pipe because it was hard enough water that without this phosphate treatment that over the, case, over the course of years, the pipe would become calcified and the diameter that's effective for flow would decrease. So you'll notice I emphasized over the course of years this corrosion and deposition control can be a problem. And so we can consider that an interruptible chemical because in the short term, it's not going to cause a risk to human health or to the environment if we run out of orthophosphate. So if the, if the metering chemical, excuse me, if the metering pump breaks down for orthophosphate, you need to get it fixed, but it's not a public health emergency. It's more of a long-term maintenance issue if the orthophosphate metering pump breaks. Okay, so any questions about how we distinguish interruptible versus non-interruptible chemicals? So in the textbook, Table 5.1 gives us some guidelines for how much chemical you should have on hand at a treatment plant. And um, just when you think about the natural disasters and supply chain interruptions that are becoming increasingly common, I think you can see the wisdom of having a little bit of extra chemical on hand besides more than just how much you need this week. You know, if your chemicals are being delivered to you each Monday, you know, like lean manufacturing would say that you should run out of what you're going to use the same moment that the delivery truck arrives and you can reconnect the new supply. There was this theory throughout the 80s that the way to improve profits was to just not even have a warehouse. Just have the trucks deliver each day the amount that you're going to use that day, and then you save the trouble of having to uh, build a warehouse, heat the warehouse, have work, warehouse workers. And so, you know, there's a lot of wisdom to that. That is the most efficient thing to just have on hand only the amount that you're going to need during the period between when it is delivered. But that efficiency is at odds with resilience. And resilience requires some redundancy built in. Just like we were talking about the redundancy of multiple inlet structures, where if you have one of your inlet structures completely obliterated by debris or some sort of damage, you want to have enough parallel redundant inlet structures that you can still bring in the volume of water needed to the treatment plant even when one is down for maintenance. And so that same principle of redundancy applies to how much chemical you want to have on hand. And so what Table 1 suggests is that for a critical chemical, like chlorine, which is non-interruptible, you should have a minimum of 30 days supply plus, on top of that, two times the shipping time. And so if you're receiving shipments once a week, then this would suggest that you should have 44 days worth of chemical on hand at all times. Um, so that if there's a hurricane or if a railway network is sabotaged, you know, a huge amount of rail traffic comes through a, uh, a single tunnel in West Virginia. And uh, it's, it's, I think, from a homeland security standpoint, one of the most uh, vulnerable locations we have is this rail tunnel that goes through Rock here in West Virginia. And if, if uh, it collapsed or was sabotaged or otherwise was out of service, then um, we'd really be in trouble and I guess we'd be glad to have some extra chlorine on hand as a uh, non-interruptible chemical. Now these ones that are interruptible, the stakes aren't so high and so only 10 days of minimum stock is suggested plus an additional 1.5 times the shipping time on, on top of that. So this storage requirement is what you would use in part to determine how big the storage tanks should be. So can, different chemicals are delivered to a treatment plant uh, in different forms. Um, and we'll talk about that in a moment, but one aspect of metering these chemicals out is uh, referred to in the text as the turndown ratio. And so here, just the, the pictorial illustration here is that you'd have multiple pumps working 
in parallel, meaning that at any given time, you may have one, two, three, four, or five of the pumps operating. And part of the reason why we have those multiple pumps is redundancy, but that's not the only reason why. Sometimes you have to have multiple, um, whether it's a metering pump or you know, like a wide range of materials, blower fans, anything that's electrical may not be infinitely variable. So not all equipment can go from zero to its maximum feed rate. Um, a lot of pumps can only operate within a pretty narrow range of conditions uh, based on the number of RPMs required for them to begin to generate pressure at the upper end, the, the rotational speed that the bearings inside of the pump can tolerate. So um, just as an illustration of this concept, let's say that we've got two different pumps that we can choose between. One of the pumps does a maximum flow rate of 2.5 liters per second. And then the lowest flow rate that pump can achieve is 1.7 liters per second. It can't go down to zero. It's just, it's either, it's not quite binary. You know, some machines are either on or off and they have no variability. This at least has a little bit of variability, maybe with a, a valve that we can control the outlet, but our variability range is between 1.7 and 2.5. Now, there's a similar pump that does the same task, but it is intended for lower flow rates. It can go between 0.27 liters per second at the low end up to 0.55. Okay, now let's consider these two options in the context of a need. What if we needed to have a system that at the high end is metering out 2.05 liters per second, but then at the minimum end, uh, it, we may, you know, like at night when there's very little demand for water, we may only need to, uh, to pump 1.1 liters per second of whatever this solution is into our treatment train. So, you know, this could be a coagulant that's going into the flocculation basin. It could be a disinfectant that we're trying to meter into the system. It could be one of these corrosion control chemicals. The point is, is pump one isn't going to work. So what's wrong with pump one? Too much. It's too much. So, you know, if, if this was chlorine that we're trying to pump into the drinking water treatment plant, in the middle of the night when we're not making as much water, we only want to put in 1.1 liters per second of that chlorine solution. But if we had pump one, we've turned it down all the way and we've got 1.7 liters per second going in. So we're over chlorinating. And people are gonna complain about, you know, the smell coming out of the shower head, their eyes will be burning. You know, even just 50% more chlorine than they're used to, people are gonna notice that. Um, so pump one doesn't work. So the question is, um, how many of pump two should we use? <clears throat> Four. Four? Four. And what is the range of flow rates we can achieve if we have four pumps? Maybe if you've got your notes, oh, I didn't put the PDF files online yet this morning. I'll do that after class. But if you've got some scratch paper handy, what's the range of flow rates that we can achieve with four pumps? This is a little bit of a trick question. No, it's 0.27 is your minimum because you can turn three pumps off. That's, that's the trick, yeah. So the, the trick is, is that we don't have to have all four, all four pumps running. So let me just show you the little illustration I did here. I'm not sure if this is recording. All right, yeah, so um, if we have all four pumps on at their lowest setting, then yeah, we will have the 1.08 at the minimum, but if we've got four in line, we've got the flexibility of you know, flicking on as many of these pumps as we need at any given time. So like if one was operational, that would be 0.27 to 0.55. And then we have the overlap with two pumps running, we can do 0.54 to 1.1. So you see that there is overlapping range. It's not a given that we would have a continuous overlap though. 
think about what if our range for each pump was a little bit narrower? Like if the pump was doing between uh, 0.35 to 0.55, it may be that there could be gaps. You know how the 0.55 is the upper limit of one pump and the lower limit of two pumps is 0.54. And so sometimes you'll see that they would have maybe like three medium-sized pumps and then one small pump. So they, they sometimes wouldn't be all the same size if the, uh, if the range was more narrow for each one, just to ensure that you really could have continuous coverage. And for sake of redundancy, you maybe wouldn't want to rely on just having a single one of those small size pumps. And so these are the things as a designer you'd want to think about is if you want to have the flexibility to meter out from zero all the way up to your maximum flow rate that's needed, you have to consider this issue of the turndown ratio and the operability range for each piece of equipment that you're installing. Any questions about this idea? Okay, so let's talk about the, the form that different chemicals may come into a treatment plant. And this is in order of least dangerous to most dangerous. And uh, the reason why dry chemicals are the least dangerous in the spectrum is that um, if they spill, they stay in one place. You know, a powder, maybe it could scatter if it gets kicked around or if there's a wind blowing. But in comparison to liquids and compressed gases, dry chemicals are less likely to go where they're not supposed to go. Um, and so sometimes treatment plants will have the, uh, the ability to choose in what format chemicals should be delivered. And chlorine is an example of something that could be delivered as a solid, as a liquid, or as a gas. And so the, uh, the safest way to receive chlorine would be as a uh, dry cake chemical. And sometimes they'll even just start off with salt as the source for chlorine and then they will go through an electrolysis process to turn it into chlorine gas using the salt as the initial feedstock. And that's just fantastically safe because you know, salt is, uh, I guess it's bad for the environment if you get too much of it in one place, but um, it's not going to cause any human health issues if a bag of salt gets broken open at the treatment plant. Some of the things that uh, we have to think about is when you are designing a treatment plant or refurbishing it is the chemicals that are coming in that are going to be consumed, you have to think about how do they get onto the site? How do they get from a loading dock to the storage location? How are they metering from the storage into the treatment? And so sometimes, you know, as civil engineers, we're doing really kind of highfalutin calculations with you know, concentrations or really sophisticated stuff, but then we lose track of practical things just like what's the path from the loading dock to the storage container? Is it wide enough for a person with a, a dolly to take a couple of sacks of you know, sodium bicarbonate to the, uh, to the feed bin? So the, the book kind of talks through some of these practical issues in terms of locating um, storage and um, like the, the loading dock facilities. Dust can be an issue uh, both because some dusts are explosive, but then also if some of these chemicals are caustic, then you know, it can irritate the lungs and the eyes of people who are working in the treatment plant. So just because dry chemicals are less dangerous than liquid and compressed gases doesn't mean necessarily that everything is without risk in these dry chemicals. So you have to uh, ensure that the rooms have adequate ventilation, and um, that there isn't any uh, risk of particulate dust getting ignited. Um, liquid chemicals are typically delivered to a treatment plant by some sort of a tank truck. And so it's recommended that every chemical that comes into the plant as a liquid has its own um, stainless steel pipe for taking it from the loading area into the storage area. And so if you have a liquid feedstock of alum coming in and a liquid feedstock of sodium hypochlorite, if you're going to be using a liquid 
disinfectant, and you have a liquid solution of, it, sometimes it's common to use specialty chemicals for coagulation, and sometimes those could come in as a liquid feedstock. So the point is that you just have to have a, a separate um, inlet line for each one of them to prevent any kind of contamination or unintended reaction. And it's also important to have spill detection and overflow sensors at the point of storage and at the point of transfer at the treatment plant. Um, and we will do some calculations here in a minute that have to do with uh, secondary containment of liquid chemicals. The most common liquefied gases that are used both in water treatment and wastewater treatment are chlorine. And chlorine can come into treatment facilities in uh, 70 kilogram cylinders, where the 70 kilograms is referring to the amount of, of, uh, of chlorine in the cylinder. It's not the overall mass. So that's just the chemical weight in the cylinder. The uh, 900 kilogram cylinders are, um, are you know, it's basically it's a, a ton of chlorine. And that's what we saw in this picture. These are one ton cylinders, and they're moved about in a treatment plant using a crane. They're you know, far too heavy for a person to move around. And uh, because these compressed gases, chlorine in particular, is so dangerous, uh, it requires specialty training for wastewater treatment plant operators. They have to have respirators and full body protection on hand and confined space training. So um, it's, it's really a... Uh, a critical issue and there are uh, you know even beyond the 900 kilogram cylinders there are occasionally rail car deliveries of compressed chlorine that will come to a water treatment plant and that creates a really enormous risk for the community that is uh, being served by a wastewater treatment plant you know if you have a rail car which is usually more than 200,000 pounds on a rail car, um, and all of it is chlorine. If that spills, usually um, emergency responder services, you know, firefighters, they're always aware of when a treatment plant is receiving their chlorine delivery. Um, you know, it's something that they monitor pretty carefully, and just like the uh, terrorism target of that rail tunnel, uh, chlorine. Um, delivery to water and wastewater treatment plants is considered kind of a, a pretty high risk thing that the authorities monitor and try and prevent any sort of attack because it's a um, kind of a soft target with high consequences if a rail car of chlorine opens up in the middle of a city. Um, some of the considerations that we have to pay attention to for liquid chemical storage is that uh, the chemicals that are dissolved in water may crystallize at a temperature other than the water begins to freeze. Um, so using alum as an example. Alum is oftentimes delivered to treatment plants as a liquid at about 50% concentration. So half alum, half water. Um, and you know, the more concentrated the better because it takes up less space and the, uh, the feed flow rates are reduced. But if alum is at 50.7%, then the, uh, the alum crystals themselves will begin to come out of solution as it is chilled down to 8.3 degrees Celsius. And so um, you know that completely rules out outdoor storage of alum at 50.7%. And you know, there are places where that probably isn't an issue. You know, if, if you're operating a treatment plant in Phoenix, Arizona, you know, maybe you could do just fine with alum at 50.7% and you're not ever going to see temperatures that low. And keep in mind though, you know, we're not worried so much about just a single overnight low. You know, if for an hour during the evening, the, wa the air temperature goes down to 8.3 Celsius, that doesn't mean that the alum is going to crystallize because it takes a long time for liquid to disperse all of its heat. Just like you know, your swimming pool 
temperature stays relatively steady through the day and night cycle. It'll only vary by a degree or so. Um, but then if we take the alum down to just 48.8%, then the crystallization risk is much, much lower. And so we could allow the solution to get as cold as 15.6 degrees Celsius before the crystallization occurs. And of course, when we have salts like alum dissolved in liquids, then that suppresses the freezing temperature of the liquid itself. OK, um, now secondary containment is important anytime we're using chemicals that we wouldn't want to get out into the environment. And uh, the rule of thumb is that you should provide 110% of the volume of the single largest storage vessel. And so if you had a series of different tanks, if you had um, you know, several different chlorine tanks and different sizes, you only need to provide enough secondary containment for the largest of them. So there's this figure in our book that kind of uh, gives us a cross-sectional view of what that secondary containment may look like. So if we have a cylindrical chemical storage tank, you just build up a concrete wall around the side of it. And uh, they're suggesting that you have the wall far enough away from the liquid that if there was a leak in the tank, you wouldn't want the, uh, the spray to go outside of the containment area. So, of course, with the orifice equation that you learned back in fluid mechanics, velocity out from one of those holes is the square root of 2GH. And so, worst case scenario, you'd assume that the leak is at the same height as this wall. And you'd want to know, for a certain water height, what's going to be the velocity out and the trajectory that's traced by the liquid. So just to save you from having to calculate the orifice equation, there's this recommended rule of thumb that just however tall the height of the, uh, um, the containment vessel is, if you add together the height of the wall and the distance from the, um, from the tank to the secondary containment, so B plus C, in the height of the wall and the distance, then adding those two together, B and C, you should have equal to the height of the liquid storage. So poor containment would be not enough volume and too close to the edge. So you'd want to center the vessel, even if, if, even if you've got the right amount of volume, you'd have to center it in the secondary containment to ensure that a liquid leak doesn't go outside of the secondary containment. Any questions about that? OK, so let's design some secondary containment. Let's get some experience with that. I've got an example here. And uh, we have a treatment plant where we are treating water at a uh, flow rate of our average demand is 1 point, uh, sorry, 4.108 MGD. Anybody remember what MGD stands for? A million gallons per day. All right, so our flow rate Q is 4.108 uh, times 10 to the sixth, right, uh, gallons per day. Okay, now one gallon, just in case you don't have it handy, is 3.7854 liters. Okay, so we were going to figure out kind of the, uh, the situation as it applies to alum. So alum is that coagulant that we want to uh, be able to apply to improve flocculation. And we're going to be dosing 60 milligrams per liter. And uh, we, we know the density of alum is 1340 kilograms per cubic meter. It's shipped as a 50% solution. Shipping time is a week and alum is non-interruptible. Let's go back to the table and remind ourselves how much we need to store for a non-interruptible chemical. Okay, so table 5.1 says that you need to have 30 days plus two times the shipping time. So um, storage amount, we need to have 30 days 
plus two times. In the case of our treatment plant, we're assuming that it gets delivered to us once a week. So this chemical comes in every week, so then two times seven days. So we want to have 44 days worth of this chemical stored in the tank. That's how many days amount we need. So the first bullet point here is I want you to calculate what volume of alum should be stored. So the water that's coming in, 1.08 million gallons per day, and we are using 60 milligrams, that's mass, of alum for every liter of water that's being treated. So your steps here, let me just write a couple of hint steps for you, and then I'm going to turn you loose to work uh, either individually or in groups. So first thing is uh, calculate the mass of alum per day that you need. And so we're trying to find out basically uh, how many kilograms of alum per day is needed. And then from that you can find out the, uh, the solution mass because you're going to find out how many kilograms per day of alum is needed, but what we know is that it's a 50% solution. So then that basically just means that you're going to have to double the amount of solution that's applied to get however much alum per day that you need. Okay, so the solution mass, basically, hint, divide by 0 0.5 to do that one. Okay, step three is um, we're going to find the, uh, the volume needed. And you're going to do that uh, based on the density. because this alum is 1340 kilograms per cubic meter. So everything till now has been on a mass basis. This is going to turn it into a volume basis. And then that will be the end of the first bullet point. OK, so let's take it to there. And uh, once we've got that volume needed figured out, then we'll talk through tank diameter requirement and containment dimensions. You're welcome to skip ahead if you want to, but I'll interject once it looks like people have calculated that volume requirement. And if you want to check your answer, flag me down, because I've got the solution here, and I'll be glad to let you know if you're on the right track. All right, so 4.108 MGD, that just means 4,108,000 gallons per day. So we convert that into liters by multiplying 3.7854. So that means we're trying to treat about 15 million liters per day of water. And if we do so at a concentration of 60 milligrams of alum added for every liter of water that's being treated, then that means it is 9.33 times 10 to the 8th milligrams of alum that's added each day. And so um, divide, by a thousand, divide by a thousand to get grams, then divide by another thousand to get kilograms. And that means that we need to add 933 kilograms of alum per day. But we can't just add pure alum. Remember that the alum comes to us in a solution that's 50% alum. So if we need 933 kilograms of alum, then that means we're going to have to add more than that. We're going to have to add 1866 kilograms of solution each day. Okay, so I'll pause for a moment just in case you need to copy some things down or check your work. Of course, if you're beyond this, you can feel free to continue.
Okay, so that's how much mass of alum we want to add. Um, and uh, if we need to store 44 days worth of it, then the mass of alum that we should store is 82,104 kilograms. I guess that's, uh, that's not the mass of alum. That's the mass of solution that we need to add. Uh, to store because I had found this 1866 in terms of the uh, solution that's required. All right, and um, okay, now taking the density into account, if we divide by 1340 kilograms per cubic meter, that's where we learned that it's uh, 61.3 cubic meters of this alum solution is how much we ought to store. That gives us 44 days worth, which is the 30 days supply plus twice the delivery time. Any questions on these calculations leading up to that point? Sorry, I don't have better handwriting. I'm always uh, self-conscious. Dr. Michelson's got the gold standard of nice handwriting, right? He says the same thing. Huh? He says the same thing you do. Or are you making a joke? No. No, he always like, sorry, my handwriting's bad. Oh, really? Yeah, well, he's got good handwriting. Um, all right, so next step is uh, we found the volume that should be stored. That gives us 44 days worth. What tank diameter is required? Um, so we're going to put this in a cylindrical tank. Volume that we need is 61.3 cubic meters. Does anybody remember what is the formula for a, a cylindrical tank, for the volume of a cylindrical tank? ID squared divided by 4. Okay, so that gives us the area this cross-sectional area here. And then if we multiply it by H, that gives us the volume. So the height times the area gives you the volume. OK, so what this question is asking is, um, if we're limited to a tank height of 4 meters, maybe that's you know how high the roof is, or that's as high as we want to go just from the strength of the tank perspective. 4 meters is our height, so H is 4, and we know that the volume is 61.3 cubic meters. Solve for the diameter of the tank that's required. So pi d squared divided by 4. Find d. So if we are going to try and have 61.3 cubic meters available, and we know the height is 4 meters, let's rearrange that equation to solve for d. It means that it's going to be 4.41 meter diameter. So you know if, if we've got some commercially available tank that is 4.5 meters in diameter, that just simply means that the liquid level wouldn't quite get all the way up to the 4 meter maximum. So that's good. Last part here is what are the minimum dimensions of secondary containment? And by secondary containment, what I mean is like these side walls. We need to provide 110% of the largest single storage vessel. So we need to provide enough volume to hold 110% of the 61.3 cubic meters. So that means our secondary containment should have a storage volume of 67.4 cubic meters. And this is just assuming a square shape and a rectangular volume because we've got these side walls that are maybe made out of concrete. So the volume of our containment is just the height of the containment walls multiplied by the two sides. 
And uh, so if the height of the wall is limited to 1.5 meters, then that means that the side length should be 6.7 meters. So just a simple volume calculation here again, but doing that will ensure we have 110% of the liquid storage so that if as soon as it's delivered we have a spill, it's not going to get up to the very top. We've got a little bit of uh, what they call freeboard available, just additional height in the storage. All right, 12.50, we're out of time. Remember that uh, your to-do includes submitting homework one by Friday at noon and reading through chapter five, which is what we covered today. Could you go back to the last slide, please? Um, with the volume? Yeah. Um,